Recording in progress. Hello and welcome back to what are we are? We are, we are in week week four. Yeah, we, we're heading yeah. into week four. We're heading into week yes. four. Well, yeah. well, yeah. welcome to the beginning of week four, everyone. Now, who who's week? Show of hands. Who 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 had the favorite week one? You, you enjoyed week one the Just most. People. Who enjoyed week one the most? The first exercises, the cold showers, the that is when we were still all having fun. Mm -hmm. You did. Okay. Who enjoyed week two the most when we did the digital detox? Nobody enjoyed that. Renee, <laughs> well done. Who enjoyed week three the most when we did the inner child questions? Well, that was good too. Okay. All right. So I want to point something out that might not be obvious to you. So I have a concept called the animal, the child, the monkey mind, and the adult. <clears throat> it's not fact. It's just a convenient way of looking at human consciousness and the human conscious experience. The animal, of course, is our animal nature. We have bodies we have inherited off the back of millions of years of evolutionary biology. We have a reptilian brain, a mammalian brain, and then we have the, the, the prefrontal cortex of the, of the human brain. <clears throat> but all of our physiognomy, all of our hormones, all of our impulses, all of our drives, everything about the Maslow's hierarchy of needs is all about this, this absolute will, this programming that we have to avoid pain, seek out pleasure, and conserve energy. And that's the programming of life. It's called the motivational triad. And when that is basically all of our needs and our urges and our drives. And we don't escape that. Part of the, the misunderstanding around spiritual development and all the rest of it is always this assumption that we, we have to just switch it off or um, it just goes away. It, of course, doesn't go away. The job is to transcend it, not to deny it or to um, cauterize it. So the animal, the child, the monkey mind, and the adult. Now, the, the child is, is our emotional experience of the world. Um, emotions themselves exist so that we can form relationships and engage with other, with other people. And how we form our relationships are through these predictive models from the moment we're young. The experience that we have through whatever care we are given, all we are able to do as very, very young people is we can't articulate anything, we don't understand anything, we don't understand the world around us. All we can do is experience pain and discomfort, the urges of the animal and cry. And based on the level of care available to us, those cries will elicit some kind of response. And through that interplay, we start developing our emotions. And all that emotions are really is a form of expectations and expectation management. So when we get an alarming shock, it's because our expectations of how the world should work, the relationship between cause and effect, our predictive model was not actually aligned with how reality actually works. So when we clash with reality, especially as a young person, and the clash is quite violent, doesn't have to be physically violent, it can be emotionally violent or psychologically violent. That is enough to cause us a sense of shock. And similarly, delight is when our expectations are exceeded. We get sad when our expectations are not met. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to be safe. We're trying to avoid pain. We're trying to seek out pleasure and we're trying to conserve energy. So that's the relationship between the animal and the child. And the monkey mind is this, this problem solver, the one that is putting the predictive models together and figuring out past and future 
figuring out the past so that we can avoid the mistakes of the past and preempting the future so we can navigate our way better through our life in the service of avoiding pain, seeking out pleasure and, and conserving energy and, and keeping these predictive models improved. Now, that's really what's going on. And the adult, the adult is the one that's not in the room when these three are all in, in um, looking after the show. And so what we've done in the first week is we are putting the animal on a leash, not a restraining leash, just like a come heel, walk next to me, we've got this, it's all going to be okay getting the animal used to a chosen discomfort so it doesn't bolt or run away or freak out or tell you stories. Because in that moment with your meditation, you're calming the monkey mind, you're prepping with the rest of the group, and then you're deciding to go through a chosen discomfort. And you tell yourself beforehand, I've got this. And while it's happening, remember we said, I've got this. And then you look in the mirror afterwards and you reaffirm to the inner child and to the self. You say, I've got this. I didn't look away. I went through that experience. And the point of doing that, including the fasting, now the cold water elicits a shock response. And in controlling our shock flight response, we are controlling the animal. Inner child work always manifests in the stomach with some sort of relationship that we have to food. Always. And that's because the stomach represents our center for um, emotional processing as a child. Now, you think that you're feeling it in your heart. You're actually just feeling it with your heart. You're actually feeling it in your stomach. And the heart is an instrument for feeling things. So you don't feel feelings in your heart. You feel feelings with your heart. So often when we have anxiety, we think it's here, but it's just here that's doing the feeling. It's actually down here in our stomachs. So the reason we do the fasting is because there's a philosophy or a, or a, or a, a first principle that says when you're trying to solve a problem, you get the problem out of the way so you can get right down to the essence of something. And the fasting allows us to get the this whole psychological connection with appetite and our relationship with food just out of the way for a day and let our body come to come to rest with what we call grace grace is nothing more than the practicing of of time and patience and letting time and nature do its own thing so you'll notice when an animal gets injured um, and you sitting there like your pet gets bitten by a snake or something and you're trying to feed it a chicken broth and it doesn't want to have a bar of that They'll just not eat for um, a day or two until they, they fast and they detoxify and their liver kicks in and processes the toxins and all the rest of it. And even if they break a leg or if they snag their, um, their skin on, on some chicken wire or something, you'll notice animals in the wild or pets, if they get injured, they won't eat. They'll actually fast because the act of fasting does wonders for your metabolism and reboots things. And um, <clears throat> it, 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 it clears out, um, we've got these little um, recycle bins inside every single cell in our body that it fills up with junk as the cell regenerates bits and pieces. And it's actually effort for metabolism to go and burn or use whatever's in that recycle bin. But once you haven't eaten for 18 hours, Something happens called autophagy, where autophagy, it's actually then kicks the body into saying, whoa, we suddenly need a source of glucose for the brain. Let's go after all the fat in the body and the body stops burning sugar and starts burning fat. And it, it decides to now use up all these loose bits of unused um, caloric uh, value, which are stored as the trash in the cells. And that's why you get this cleansing feel. Now, we, our, our emotions are stored in our body, especially our psychologically traumatic emotions are stored in the body. That's why when you're doing exercise or yoga, sometimes you'll have an emotional bout or a cry, or if you're doing a fast or if you're doing a diet, um, 
you'll notice that emotion will come through that. So we fasted, we did the ice bath or the, the cold shower, and we did the meditation. And that was to calm the child, calm the animal, and calm the monkey mind, and let the adult step up. And the second week, what we did is we reduced all the, the digital noise, all the traffic, all the social media, all the, because I will say to you again, systems fail when their inputs exceed their throughput. And your system of pausing and rationalizing and even finding stillness, that system of attention becomes overwhelmed and then if more inputs are coming at it, then it can process and pause, it will fail. It will become overwhelmed. It's the same with your emotions. It's the same with a system of justice. It's the same with a, uh, a computer. It's the same with anything. Any system will fail if the inputs exceed the throughput. Now, there's a little joke that I say with my friends that any machine is a smoke machine if you use it wrong enough. It's, it's silly, but any system can become overwhelmed if you throw too much at it. So we've calmed the animal, we've calmed the child, we've calmed the monkey mind, allowed the adult to come into the room, start getting to know our adults, getting to trust our adult. The animal and the child get to trust the adult. And then we reduce the noise. Now, with the trust that we have with the animal and the child and the adult stepping into the room and the reduction of noise, now we're in a position to constructively turn inwardly and hold some very difficult questions. That's why we sat with the silver questions. So we didn't just do this shit randomly. There was always method to this madness. Are there other ways? Sure. But there's a reason why I did this now. Not to shame anybody who didn't do the practices or didn't get the most out of it, but the truth is you will and would have gotten the most out of it if you had done the practices consistently in order. And even so, depending on the journey that you took through childhood to get here, even then that experience will be difficult for some people. I know it was for me. So what we're going to do now, bear in mind, this is a recorded session. So whatever you say here, you need to be comfortable that this is going to go on for posterity. It's not like anybody's searching my workout and watching videos about um, 11 random legends on the internet, but you still need to be comfortable with whatever you say. Here. So that's my reminder. So we're going to talk and share a little bit about that. And then we can discuss the practices for, um, for the following week. And I'll give you a hint. Those practices are going to be facing the discomfort of growth. Growing is uncomfortable. The first act of growing that a seed does is to break open. It's in a safe, closed shell that has kept it secure. The first act of coming into this world that a child does is to leave, to die to the old safe world that it was, it was in. And that is as close as death as that little entity or that little being will ever experience or has ever experienced. It's traumatic. It's uncomfortable in every conceivable way. And Growth is uncomfortable. It is pain. It's simply because of that act of breaking open. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider ways in which we can take a leap forward in our own personal growth. Because if not now, when? So... I've done some work with Romy and I've done some work with Luis and it looks like I'm going to be doing some work with, with Valerie. 
Um, so you have each been on your own um, growth trajectories and the, the more serious steps you take, the more difficult it is and the more pain it causes. Those are not easy steps that you took. I know, Romy, it, it, it cost you a lot to make some of those choices to grow and to change. And I know that your childhood was not trivial. It wasn't just a, a walk in the park. It was, it was extremely confronting when we had to talk about it. It wasn't just the kind of thing you can just brush off. But I also got the sense when we were working together that you couldn't bear another year of your life or another week of your life going by without taking taking charge so growth is growth is painful growth is uncomfortable and if we don't become used to facing discomfort and used to enduring a chosen pain or a chosen um facing our fears in a chosen way we will remain small forever and we will remain stuck on this block and life is too beautiful to do that and we all come here with wounds of some kind so I don't know who wants to talk or who wants to share about their experience with the questions. You can make it as, um, as deep or as casual as you like. You can basically talk around the issue a little bit. Who wants to get us started? Don't all shout at once. <laughs> one, one at a time, everyone. <laughs> Well, let's begin with what was your experience like with the questions and who of you show of hands actually processed the second lot of questions I emailed? Who of you saw the second lot of questions I emailed? Oh, so you did see them. You are getting them. Okay. All right. Who of you processed the first load of questions I sent through? Uh, is that everyone? Sarah, did you do it? Yes, Morgan? I did right away, but it feels like it was a lifetime ago. <laughs> the beginning okay. of the week, like so long ago. All right. Renee, did you do them? Yeah. Vivian? Yes, I did. Excellent. Okay, actually, let's do this the easiest way around. Who didn't? Okay, that's oh, I did half of them. Oh, you did half. Yeah, it just took me a bit of time to allocate enough, should we say, bandwidth in my mind to and timing that I felt like doing a a thorough investigation. So I went through the first the first half. But I haven't really got through the second half yet, but I'll get it no, through in the next couple sure. of days. I'll get it done. No, no, it's, done. That, that's exercise for you. You do as you wish. So what I want to mm. understand is who would have preferred not to have done that? that's not bad that's a good outcome <clears throat> so if you would have preferred to have done it surely somebody must have something to ask or to say or to observe or to share one person we're busy facing discomfort here folks so I guess what okay. are we supposed to talk about Rocco just kind of like what's, what's the question well, by and large, and having done this to about probably about 140, 150 people, one second, Louise, about 150 people in person, the at least 80, 90% of people had never asked these kind of questions before. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if, if we have arrived at somewhere in our 30s or our 40s, having never taken stock of the beliefs and mindset that are mm -hmm. programming most of our choices today and defining most of our relationships and most of our expectations around things. And they've just never been questioned. It can be quite a, a, a confronting or a, um, it can cause a bit of a psychological flip or it can raise a lot more questions. It can destabilize relationships that we're in. Because we often find that some of these houses are built on 
strange foundations. Yeah. Sorry, Louise, you, you had a you had a question, my brother. Or a comment. No, no, a question. Yeah, it was a comment to talk about my experience, which um it was hard. <laughs> and which I imagine for everybody as well, because even speaking about it, it's kind of hard. We don't ask these questions. And so the first time I approached the questions, I was meditating and I brought them into my mind, but no answers came, just a lot of emotions and mixed emotions. Yes. And do you know why? Because it's in the subconscious. Because and because the child doesn't have language. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Very good. Sarah? Um. I had actually logged them mostly on my phone, so I can't see them, but I can say my overall um, with... Um, Do you, you want like to switch your camera off question? for a second if you want to? You can... You um, can... Well, I'll just say what I was going to say, and, and then as we go further, I'll yeah, yeah, yeah. see yeah, yeah, no off. But in general, um, conclusion that I came to was that, you know, um, I had a really good upbringing. My parents were very, very loving, um, and they taught me to love but they didn't teach me boundaries. And um, I always idealized my parents as being like the perfect parents because they really were, but they really failed in that, um, not teaching me those boundaries. And that's where, you know, I mean, like eh, when you have something, you know, you're like, oh, looking at, you know, the child and, you know, you know, I had, a, you know, so many people have such terrible upbringings and I didn't, you know, and yeah. to blame my parents for anything, it, it, that it felt wrong <laughs> to do that. Um, because, you know, but no parent really wants to do anything wrong. And they just, they did it in an, unintentionally, obviously we all do, but the whole, um, and I don't, it, somewhere in one of your podcasts, I think that you've talked about having sympathy, but not empathy. And I, yeah. I, and that, that was, a, that was a huge wake up call to me because I was taught empathy and it was, it's too, well, it's I too say much. compassion, not, not empathy. Compassion. Yes. yes. Compassion. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Not, not sympathy, but compassion. Yeah. Yeah. That's a different word there, but, but yeah, like, um, uh, really, uh, and that, and I've been learning boundaries the last few years, but I never had like seen it in that way until I sat through those questions right. and kind of realized that, but right. that's just kind of, um, no, no, that's good. Um, and there was something I wanted to share with you, but uh, again, I create so much content. I, I lose my own stuff. <laughs> um, uh, you may have seen it online. Damn it. I'm going to find this thing quickly. It was about, I don't know where my crap is. One second. Let's see if I can find it. While I'm busy browsing for this, I don't know if anybody else has a share. No one? Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes, Beatrice, go for it. Okay, so I'm also just going to switch it to my notes quickly. Yeah, go for so it. This, this was difficult for me as well, but in the sense of, um, I think I po posted something to that effect on the, the Telegram group where... That's right. You're sort of looking for something that... Um, I'm trying to find where's the thing that's hurting to try and find what was causing that. And I, I couldn't really draw that line. So uh, yeah, I, I started relatively early with the questions and at some stage I just thought maybe I'm just overthinking it. So I'll just share with you what I have at this stage. Yes. So um, what did love look like as a child? Uh, attention, praise and, and other rewards. Um, forgiveness was not bringing it up again. What did an apology need to look like? Um, sincerely remorseful. So mm -hmm. in other words, if I made an apology, I need to, you know, however that's judged, needed to be seen as sincerely remorseful. Mm -hmm. um, what was expected of me to accept as an apology? 
the fact that it wasn't brought up again. Um, what did a good man look like? I suppose, I think the only person that could model that was basically my dad and then um, sort of just elaborate on that. He's hardworking, unwavering, disciplined, motivated. Um, success looked like setting and achieving goals and spending time in, spending time together because that's sort of a, the fruit of the success and yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. I realize it's success in a very materialistic sort of way almost but um, you know spending time together is one of the fruits that you that you don't have to work seven days a week yeah um, 18 hours a day yeah um, sex and intimacy that uh, yeah I never had that talk with my parents I had to sort of figure that out for myself which uh, in hindsight wasn't <laughs> I don't think I found the best way but mm. uh, that's much as I'll say about that for now <clears throat> what did it mean to be a good kid um, doing as you're told um, my idea of God and hold on to is... that one okay the doing as you told um, keep going mm. what was your idea of God and sin um, I used to be a Christian and so in other words Christian uh, Christianity and the Bible what did friendship look like <clears throat> spending time Yeah, you've, we've lost the audio there, Petrus. Uh, what was expected of me as a friend? My friends really didn't expect much of me except to not be an asshole. Yeah. And then, <laughs> uh, what did I expect in, in to, from others? Uh, loyalty and encouragement. That, a lot of that sounds uh, fairly reasonable. And the, the, the two comments or questions I've got for you is, in the beginning, you said, I was looking almost for the source of pain and I couldn't quite discern it. Does that mean you have some form of pain that you can't put your finger on? Psychological yeah. discomfort? Yeah, there's, there's, there's something somewhere that doesn't, doesn't sit right. Okay. I'm not sure. Now, there was a man called Jiddha Krishnamurti very interesting story, but one of his most profound quotes is that there is no, it is no sign of good health to be well adjusted in a sick environment. And the most rational response in 2021 with the state of the world and the state of society and the state of public discourse and the state of education, and the state of healthcare, and the state of everything, the most rational response is discomfort, dis-ease, concern, a little bit of background anxiety. It sounds perfectly rational. <laughs> oh, thank you, right. The next thing is that we, there was something interesting uh, Sarah said. She, she said, you said, Sarah, um, you know, my parents were wonderful parents and I thought that they were the best ever, but um, I, I blame them for not teaching me. They, you said they failed. They failed to teach me boundaries. Interesting you used the word failed. I don't think I used failed, did I? You did. I don't feel it. Oh. You did. Um, and it's slip. important to remember. So I've got this, this other piece that I wrote, which is called They Might Have Told Us. And mm -hmm. this is really... A, a message about where this, this journey into spiritual and psychological adulthood that we need to take, where it's such a, a knee jerk reaction thing to turn around. I, I, because I didn't really have a mother and a father, I had such a, it would always hit me in the face when I would see people complain about their mother and their father. Mm. And how tied they were into this like temporary relationship, which is so fundamental and defines us so much. But how easy it is to forget that they were the product of the parenting that they received. And mm. which were in turn the product of the parenting they received and they received and they received and they received and they received. And they received. And right until the very beginning. The piece goes like this. They may have told us. They might have told us when we were young 
that self-ownership is a kind of leadership where you do not expect of yourself to master the world around you, but rather it is an allowing of mistakes. They might have said not to get so hung up on the successes or failures of a moment. They should have said to allow yourself to try and not expect to get it right the first time. Allow yourself even, perhaps, to give up on things that are no longer meant for you or were never truly yours to begin with. They should have said to allow yourself to try and not expect to get it right the first time. Allow yourself even perhaps to give up on things, to give up on things that are no longer meant for you or were never truly yours to begin with they might have let us know that the path to wholeness involves asking no one but yourself for permission and wearing all regrets and wearing all regrets like a meadow wears the morning mist and afterwards the dew. They really should have told us, but they did not know themselves because no one told them. And now no one else is coming. And the whole point of this Facing Discomfort group and the point of Eyes Wide Open Life is for adults like us to spiritually link arms and make a commitment to each other and ourselves so that a future generation does not look back on this generation covering their mouths in shame at what we continue to allow in our huge amount of self-concern and our negligence of everything around us, but chose rather that this rising storm of outrage and dysfunction, which is a cause and effect of generational trauma, unprocessed generational trauma, that we do not allow that past us. So that this wonderful opportunity of life can be given as a gift to future generations as a launch pad into a wonderful golden future that is unencumbered by all the bullshit and all the pain that we have to suffer. And Viktor Frankl said, when you have a purpose, a noble purpose, you can endure any pain as soon as your pain has meaning. And let me give you all the meaning of your pain. The meaning of your pain is to be able to find a way to reconcile it with grace and stop throwing the stick of responsibility over the fence of who you were yesterday. You just begin again today and you link arms with the rest of us and we move forward and we keep processing our pain. And the purpose for that, the gift that we give to future generations and to anyone we come into contact with, even if it's not our own children, is this, 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 this gift of being able to face the future just on the future's terms, dragging no momentum from our past into this moment so that they can take this. We, we don't have language to describe how beautiful and amazing life and the world can be. And so our job is to Somebody put it differently. They said, when we have a why, we can endure any how. When we have a why, a purpose, a reason that we're doing something, we can endure any how we endure it, any amount of pain, any amount of suffering. Your suffering was not without meaning. And the meaning wasn't always easy to understand. And really what you're searching for, really the reason that you can't let go and can't process and can't move on, is because you cannot find a meaning to it. You cannot find a meaning to why it happened. What is the question that a child asks over and over and over as they try to make contact with the world? One question. Why? 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 You are the adult that must turn to your inner child and say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I was not there. I'm here now. That is all you can do. And it's not one and done. 
you do it over and over and over and over again until you believe yourself, until the inner child believes you, until the animal believes you. And then you move forward. And a day does come when it's done. I promise you. A day does come when it's done. And the, the moment isn't an unburdening. It isn't a line of redemption that gets thrown from the outside in. It isn't a magic spell. It isn't an ayahuasca ceremony. It isn't a mantra. It isn't any practice. It is simply a stance, a way we face the world where we act, believe, and feel in the bottom of our hearts that no one else is coming. That's it. And if we ever want to get there, the way to get there is by facing chosen discomfort. Because facing discomfort is a fucking superpower. And if you can face your discomforts with grace, you're going to get through this. Whatever it is, whatever it looks like, whatever pain you're sitting with. <clears throat> now, some of us suffered quite severe and significant neglect and abandonment as young people in different ways. And the most egregious form of neglect is to neglect a wound. And the harshest form of wounding of a social animal, of a human, is neglect. Those two are tied into each other. When a child gets injured, they run quickly over to show you the wound. And what they need is attention and care. And so I'll say again, the, the most cutting wound psychologically is the wound of neglect. And the worst kind of neglect is to neglect a wound because then it suppurates and festers and scars. Kapow. <laughs> And drop. Mm. Every single one of us lives with that in some way or form. Because even if you arrive at life in adulthood with a perfect idyllic childhood, nobody survives childhood unscathed. Parenting is a hundred percent failure rate. A hundred percent. Catherine, my sister, what is your question, my darling? So it's funny. It's funny how you mentioned the fact that you said that um, that as a kid you want to be tended to the wound, and I have this experience when I was growing up and I was very young, and and I saw one of the mothers, like one of the kids had like a boo-boo or how they said yeah, it. Yeah, a boo-boo. And I remember the the mom like getting to her knees and and tending to it and giving it kisses and saying, it's all right. It's all and it was the the silliest thing. But the fact that I thought it was the silliest thing was kind of sad at that moment because I was like, oh, I wish that was that was love for me. It like that was love, the caring and tender like the gentleness to tend yes. that and that at home I didn't have that that it was more yes. of like it up, shake it off yes. you know you, you gotta move on and it's like whoa <laughs> so no, when you a, said that I, I like, recognize what you're saying exactly and what I teach is um <clears throat> that first instinct was what we call shadow projection so you immediately project the defense against your own wound so, oh, that's so ridiculous. Um, you're telling, so that there's a saying that goes, um, if you listen to people carefully, they tell on themselves. 
which means if you're in a relationship or a friendship with somebody, what they find confronting or addictive. So I've got a mother-in-law who she's an Irish matriarch and she wasn't shown a lot of care and, 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 and affection and growing up. And she had to basically be a tough sister for her five, um, for her five brothers. And uh, the one day there was um, both her and my, and, and my wife worked for the same um, Catholic education organization for a while. And there was one of these evenings where it was uh, a sort of um, uh, partners were also invited and someone was up there doing a talk and there was a woman with her hand on her husband's back and she was just stroking his back, just showing him love. And I had been with Dimpner for a while and we were doing work on conscious relationship. And so I'd explained this concept to her and she was figuring it out because she had her own shock about certain things. And her mother, like, oh, like, got all reviled and it's ridiculous. I just wish that woman would stop. And Dimpna just turned and noticed that this strong emotional reaction was coming because she was unable and had never got it. And the, the, the thing is, like, at that moment, I was like, but it was in that moment that I realized that I was, that I thought about it, that it was ridiculous. I came yeah. home. And I remember telling my mom, like actually questioning her, like putting her on the spot. And like, she how would come you don't do this? Bad. How like, come we don't get she, KFC? Yes. No, she would be like, oh, that's her. Uh, we don't, that's we not don't my do that here. Yes. But the fact is I was a third child too. This comes with the questions and it's like, I'm a third child. So for me, it was more of like in the moment, I would also know that, that I didn't like that. So I would yeah. also, I would also try to, I was trying to give empathy, the empathy that I never received from my sisters mm, or mm, from my parents. Mm. And so it's, it all like- No, I recognize that experience. And for everybody else's context, you, what you'll find is what outrages you and what frustrates you, you're always telling on yourself secretly. Mm. That's why you always find these um, rabid pastors that are always absolutely- um, so vehemently anti-gay, they always come out as, as um, homosexual, always, because nobody gets that animated over something if you don't have something to hide. Nobody does. And, you know, there's another post of mine that says, whatever you fear, whatever you strive against, whatever irritates you, is moving you. You are being moved. Emotion. And to become still, if it's like anything to become, if there's a God, if it's like anything to become like God, it is to not be moved. It is to be still. And the only way you can come to stillness is not being easily triggered. And that means consciously processing these things not with the monkey mind but with the awareness and sometimes there isn't english language for an answer it's just feelings and what i have noticed is that so much of our life our discomforts we attach story to it we create the story we propagate the story. We keep the story alive. And true liberation from all of that drama comes from separating out just the feeling, just the sensations, and creating a space between the sensation, the raw sensation. What am I feeling? What is anxiety feel like? How do I know? That's why we say when we're fasting, ah, this is what hungry feels like. Ah, in the cold shower, this is what cold feels like. Because we've never actually faced discomfort. We've just faced the fear of discomfort and panicked and ran away, mentally ran away, looked the other way, looked away, not being present. And when you can start separating out the sensation from the story, how odd, Luis, that you do this almost for like a staple hobby, this mindfulness. Now to take that lens and turn it on the self. And when the feeling comes up right there in that moment, right there in that moment, you watch the story come up 
then you get to question, is the story even fucking true? And how much of it do I want to keep believing? Because at bottom, all this is, is a trigger. And the more I become desensitized to the trigger, the less moved I am. And then the adult is in the room. And then the adult is in the room. In a very real sense. So, any more questions? Uh, Vivi and I had a had a fun exercise. We uh, we worked together, and so we did some of the questions at the same time. Nice. Sitting in the space and then kind of talked about it, and it was just interesting. I don't. Is this okay, Vivian? If I talk about this a little bit? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, cool. So we, you know, we'd write out like, what did a good man or woman look like? And then we'd talk about how we read that question and how we applied it. And, uh, you know, as a kid, I was the fourth kid out of seven. And my dad just said I blended into the woodwork. Like I was never a problem. But I think it's because I took everything very like, just from my perspective, and I've done that most of my life. I didn't take in like what my parents thought necessarily or what the community would think about the situation. And I don't know if I just came down with that. I feel very blessed because I don't think I have as much like a, I mean, I've created my own trauma kind of via myself. Um, but, you know, whereas Vivian kind of took like, why don't you explain it, Vivian, how you took these questions sometimes, some of them. Yeah, I mean, some of it was just being um, colored by doing um, Lacey Phillips to be magnetic program where like the, the focus really was looking at like what your programming was and what the adults around you were saying like about any, any of these things really similar. It's fundamentally a very similar practice. Yeah, right, right. Mm. Um, so yeah, what I what I was finding is I was really focusing my answers on oh what were the messages I was getting and what was so lovely is like Renee's just like came straight I mean it was like something about like what was success and she talked about and it was so wonderful because I was like oh yeah totally I felt that way too um like success was like the people I can around read it like, you want me to oh, read yeah, it yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. What, what, what did success look like? A nice clean house, money to have new things that were expensive-ish, clean car with no dents, a nine to five job that had you home for dinner and in a good mood, flying on a plane was especially cool, <laughs> and going to a tropical island, uh, at tropical places, having a college degree and an office job like white collar, like that's what success was to Wow, me. that's actually a really clear picture that I would have said, as even though I would have never written it down, that you've s explained it that way. I'm actually wondering why I could never articulate it that honestly and that clearly because growing up as a teenager, that's what you saw. You saw holidays on airplanes, going to a fancy location, having cool shit, getting a job. Yeah. That was literally the definition of success. And that narrative was given to us. There's no ways, even as a fourth child, you concocted that purely in that was, was a that lot was, of television. <laughs> Yeah, I guess well, this is what I mean, right? So this was all this was all inherited. It's all yeah, inherited. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely all inherited. Now, my, can, I, can I jump in? Yeah, go for it, Vivian. Because what's really interesting for me is like, so my dad is this like crazy Dutch, like kind of rebellious, artsy, kind of punkish dude. And uh -huh. so all of that kind of stuff, I was taught was bad like those are all bad things you're fucking being uh, because he was hand. um he was like anti-establishment sort of a thing right right, right, Complete. right and right. also i grew up in like this very like anti-establishment community in northern california At, but what but all those things that renee said was like yes that's what i wanted there's this really funny thing where i always would say i just want a white picket fence when i was a little kid and my dad would be like and he'd tease me about that, right? He'd be like, oh, you just want to wipe it, right? Because my dad also didn't do the like coddling little kids thing. It was like totally like any conversation went, any subject, like no, nothing appropriate, inappropriate, right? Like, so it's, yeah. Anyway, it's just really interesting. Like when Renee said, it was like, yes, of course, that's what I wanted too. Yeah. And um, we bloody well all wanted that. A lot of us. We all wanted that. And even though we can't articulate that, but we all of our ideas are borrowed. 
All of them. All of our words are borrowed. Every word is a made up word. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, we, which is why I work with archetypes because even though all words are made up words, somewhere deep in our subconscious, deep in our psyche, we've got some pretty strong overlap of our ideas of father, mother. Even if our father or our mother, or we didn't have one, there's a space holder or a placeholder of where a good one should be. And in the sense of betrayal that we felt towards our fathers or our mothers, it was precisely because we had an image of what a good one was or what we felt we deserved and the fact that we didn't get it. And there's archetype for hero. There's an archetype for king, for queen. And when I'm doing conscious relationship work with people, I often ask, especially the ladies, like um, who was raised to, to see them, themselves as a princess amongst the girls? Who was daddy's princess? Now, nobody in this group, but Definitely that's not me. Yeah. <laughs> Catherine was. <laughs> Were you, Catherine, were you daddy's princess? Right. Now, the challenging thing with princesses is a princess is not a queen. And a princess will never become a queen. A princess is a princess with all of the attendant things that you imagine. The tiara, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not watering down your parade there, Catherine. Um, the universal experience of being told that you're a princess is to set you up to have challenges in relationships because you expect to be treated like a princess. Now, I don't know if that's the impression that you were given, Catherine, might be, go for it. But the thing is, the funny thing is, um, <laughs> Yes, like it, it was kind of brought up, you know, like my dad would always be like, hey, but he was very also like very, um, hey, your mom is kind of very young, like very a queen. And my dad would always teach me like, no, it's okay to drop a few jewels. You know, like it's a stupid metaphor, but he would always teach me to like, to change my own like oil car to like, oh, like to resolve for myself. He had three daughters. So for him, it was like, no, you have to learn how to fend for yourself, but also like be treated like this because we know how men are and that the, like, yeah, I think that's actually healthier than most, to be honest. I wouldn't call that princessy. Yeah. But the princess part was more in the relationship wise that I wasn't taught how to deal with. It was all, be, my mom would be like, oh, I never fought in front of you and now it's more of like oh it's okay to fight in front like not to fight but to teach the child that it's okay to have fights and this is how you resolve it conflict and resolution I yeah yeah, exactly. yeah. Since i never saw that side it was easy for me to say oh why are, why are there problems why are there problems oh then then it's, it mustn't it, it must not be working like those kind of things it's not about the princessy side of oh who's going to like build me a castle it, yeah. it wasn't like that it was more of like my dad was like no 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 you build your own castle with right. if you want to do like you know it was more of that but so you know, just, that was like, a princess in name only it, it, it wasn't the it wasn't the arch archetype of the princess so the relationship it was like the relationship was materialistic like oh let me like take you here and they have to teach you how to do this and this is the only way like if they they open the door like that, that and for me growing up it was kind of like unlearning all of those things not to expect the men to do all of these things to resolve my life to, because my dad would teach me that but my mom would i would see a different thing like mm -hmm. my mom was oh right what you, what you were was modeled different. was different yeah, yeah. Ex exactly like when, whenever you ask those two things what was love and how was it modeled it was oh love it was kind of like a child view oh, it was movie it was this it was that it was gifts it was all of these things and well, my parents are very unemotional, like, you know, and this is how they would. So what I would see, what I was seeing was very the princessy type. So, yeah, but it kind of contradicts itself. But yeah. Right. So the the point about the archetypes was that um, there are there are universal human experiences um, 
or there is a universality to human experience based on archetypes. So when I say the hero's journey, everyone can relate to what that means. When we say a magician, everyone can sort of understand what that means. And there's some subtlety and nuance as well, because there is an archetype of a warrior, right? That is the, the archetype that we appeal to inside of ourselves to confront things, to, to fight battles, etc. But close your eyes for a moment. If I say warrior, that's almost like the umbrella term for an archetype. But a soldier is similar to, but not the same as a warrior. And a god is similar to a soldier, but not exactly the same as. And a knight and a champion and a, so on and, so, and a hunter. A hunter is similar to a warrior, similar, but not the same as. They are related archetypes, but they differ. Now, I'll give you another one. A magician, an alchemist is similar to a magician. A sorcerer seems similar. A shaman seems similar, but it's different somehow. A druid seems similar but different somehow. Now come back to the room. Now, the fact that you can conceive of these archetypes and you have a relationship to them, and then we can cut it ever, we can slice it ever finer, and then you find that you actually have an, a psychological or emotional insight as to how this differs to that, means there's quite a lot of nuance going in there, going on in there, in, in the in the our understanding or our grasp of, of archetypes. So sometimes we have Rocco's version of psychology and spiritual and psychological self-repair. And then we have some stuff from Jung and then we have Joseph Campbell and then we have Alan Watts and Terence McKenna and Buddha and Zen and Taoism and Gnosticism and Sufi and Yogi and Tibetan and Theravada Buddhism. And for, for every kind of way that we've baked our noodles on this planet, we've got some different version of isms or a different slice or a different take. And systems fail when their inputs exceed their throughput. How do we choose amongst all these gazillion things, many of them that are fantastic, and the reason I go with archetypes is because if you slice away all the chafe, all the noise, all the isms, all the special language, all the cuteness, all the diagrams, all the pictures, and you get right down to the bottom with the simple symbols and the simple archetypes and our psychological relationship to these things, we get to a, a, a truth that is universal, doesn't matter where you come from, doesn't matter what experience you've had, there's a way through the door of self-understanding over there that doesn't get watered down by different people's ideas and different people's projections. And fundamental things like love and forgiveness and success, we had these innate feelings and ideas about them, but what was modeled to us and what was shown to us and what was taught to us and what was projected onto us is all the mess of all the badly parented parents that we had and all the kids at school and all the movies we watched and the, and the last relationships we had and the tumultuous, uninformed, chaotic, traumatic childhoods that some of us went through. And this is the programming and the understanding and the formulation of ourselves and our relationship with everything that we're more moving around the world with. And nobody has a book on you. Nobody has a course on you. The best thing you can do is accept your own nature, acceptance. And it's not a case of doing or learning more. It is, a, in fact, a case of unlearning, of undoing, of undoing all of this programming. So I said right in the beginning, what we need to do <clears throat> is like in that movie, Amelie, her father takes his toolbox out every Sunday and unpacks everything and cleans it and oils the tools and, and vacuum cleans the toolbox out and puts the things that he wants back in there. And her mum does the same with her big carpet bag, handbag. She takes all of her slips and her makeup and her jewelry and everything out. 
and she cleans them and throws things away and runs it through with a vacuum cleaner and only puts the things back in there that matters to her. And this is how we put ourselves together as adults. We don't find ourselves, we make ourselves discerning. And we choose what we want to be. It's like, it's like waking up from a dream and catching a, a, a glowworm, like a firefly, and putting it in a jar. And that becomes your intention. And you build yourself off of that. And you get to be anything you want. You get to do, you get to, this game, this life is a game. And you can make this game as interesting as you like. The only right way to worship is your own way. But to do that, you need to break first. Because everything about you is built on a set of illusions and, and narratives and beliefs. And you cannot go into a future holding on to those things. And that is such a personal, like individual journey for every single person. And I guarantee you the places where you think your wounds are, later on you will think that they are trivial. I promise you. Because the ambitions that you have now to get past a certain place or a certain wound or to find somebody special or to get past some sort of trauma or to take this corner. One of the reasons we put that question about success in there is because we get tied in our young minds to this idea of success. We put this like sort of ideal up on a hill of what we want to do and what we want to become. And then sometimes even when we fail at that, when it was unrealistic or it wasn't our path, we sit and punish ourselves because we didn't get there in some way. Now, true potential, the true potential, actualization doesn't mean becoming something else or someone else. Actualization means becoming yourself, following your own script, just sincerely and honestly to the absolute letter. Even if it costs you everything, at least you will have yourself. And that journey of actualization, that thing that you're going to one day become, that's going to fill your, look, I must be honest with you. I fill my cup. I'm so happy that I'm me now. I'm so happy that I went through what I went through. I'm so grateful for everything I am and everything that I have. I'm truly grateful and I'm truly at peace. And more than at peace, I wake up happy with myself. I really like the guy in the mirror. In a, in a very healthy, fully acceptant way. And to get there, I had to let go of everybody else's questions. And I had to start asking my own question. And all the ambitions that I held on to, I had to wake up from this childish dream that those ambitions were too small for what I was going to become. To set an ambition is to limit yourself. Ambition by its very nature is the giving up of ambition. Because in your small juvenile self, this dream that you create is a, is a limited little thing that you are chasing. And as you unfold and as you grow and as you break open and as you become more you, if you keep chasing that small thing, you will remain small. But if you enter into a conversation with the world, asking some things and getting feedback and moderating your questions and asking new things and becoming curious about where you are, the actual path will start opening up in front of you. And it's already there, right here underneath your feet, right where you are now. The path is always right where you are now. Right beneath your feet. And it's not sexy big questions like, how do I join with the divine or how do I become enlightened? Forget all that crap. How do I love myself? How do I fully accept myself fully with no bullshit? My body, my mind, my accent, my face, my hair, my true wants. How do I face what I truly want without shame and without guilt? That's what this journey is about.
It's radical, radical self-honesty. And anything else is a fucking waste of time. It just is. You don't need to be what anything else and what any book says you ought to be. You just need to accept, fully accept yourself. And then we'll see what we see. And everyone's journey is different. It has to be. So on the back of that, here's the exercise for next week. It's one very simple exercise that I cannot give. You have to create the exercise. You have to find out and put your big boy pants on now. And you have to submit to me what your area of growth is. It doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be glamorous. It has to be something that you've been avoiding. Because you're avoiding it because you're afraid. And fear is not in the way. Fear is the way. And remember, very carefully, all of you, fear is not danger. And what I'm not suggesting is you go and do something psychologically dangerous for yourself. That's not prudent. We're not trying to be daredevils here. But you know in your heart the difference between fear and danger. And you know the thing that you're afraid of. For some people, it's breaking up with someone. For somebody, it's deciding to change careers. For some, time, for some of us, it's a conversation with someone. It's an admission. And remember, honesty, honesty is not truth. Honesty is facing the way in which we are afraid of the truth. She lost Valerie, but she's got Max, a very hey hey. hey. I just... No worries. <laughs> Did you catch all of that? Pardon? Did you hear all of that? Uh, yeah, I just had to go for like five seconds to get my charger. Sure, but just... while you were away, did you have an earpiece on or did you miss what we said? I missed the last five seconds. But okay, the through... last five seconds was the most important. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, here we go again. I'm you need sorry. to find some way that you can face a fear so that you can grow. And very specifically, fear is not dangerous. So we don't want anyone to be facing something dangerous. We don't need to be crazy or superheroes here. We all know what that thing is that we're avoiding. Okay. That's me. <clears throat> I'll stay on the air for five minutes for some questions, if you have any. And just for the record, you're all beautiful people. And it's, it's, I'm quite humbled that you stuck this out and you're just here listening to me rambling on and you're getting something from this. It's beautiful. So. Thank you for rambling on. You said honesty isn't truth. What was the full phrase? What is no, honesty it's, then? It's, it's the facing the way in which we're, um, we're afraid of the truth. But can I be transparency? I guess to... Uh, Say again? Can I be transparency as to like who you are when you say honesty? Or, I don't know. Yeah, well, it can be many things, but... <clears throat> um, the, the, the distinction I'm trying to make is we think honesty is telling the truth and it really is what it is, is facing the way in which we're afraid of what the truth is about something specific. And that's not from me, that's from um, Papa White. <laughs> David White, David White, that guy is the guy. Wow. Said of David White, he is a far better ambassador of my overdue message. <laughs> it's 
affected by me. <laughs> yeah, I got to get one of his books of poetry. I haven't. I just, <sighs> Man, I just, just, you, you can't pick a wrong one. Yeah. You know, um, I especially okay. like uh, The Bell and the Blackbird and um, Pilgrim. Pilgrim is sensational. Road seen than not seen, the hillside. Hiding then revealing the way you should take. You have to read that poem, Santiago. It's quite phenomenal. That poem, that poem that you sent me, I don't know how many months ago, but oh my gosh. Which one, Santiago? Santiago, yeah. Yeah, that's that's boss. That just broke me. The yeah. First time it, broke. <laughs> it breaks. It breaks everyone. <laughs> Uh, I, I send it to everyone. It's like my recommended reading. Nobody walks away unscathed without um, getting David White's Santiago. I'll actually find it yes. for you all. <laughs> and put it in the link. If you haven't watched it already, um, yeah, what are you doing with your life? <laughs> uh, in fact, don't watch it. Just listen to it. Um, well, I yeah, the one you sent me was just uh, the audio with the nice little bubbly images in the background yeah wasn't... yeah that's exactly yeah, the one music. that's the and one oh. i'm about to um yeah i'm gonna send you the link the link is in the the chat of this message so here's what i've done to amplify this poem rocco i think i've mentioned it to you yeah i listen I go outside. I almost act it out because I, I can't, like, I know the words, but they don't, I haven't memorized it, but I almost act it out in me to the earth and the universe. Yeah, it's absolutely really beautiful. It's like, it's like, what's the word? I don't know. It amplifies it. Yeah. It makes yeah. it quantum. quantum. Yeah. Yeah. I know what you mean, man. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, if there's no more questions or no more comments or no more um, things to say, we're, we're nearly at our, our last week. All there will be now is the wrap-up. Um, does everybody remember that I'm running and accepting your nature course in January? Mm -hmm. So that will be much more structured than this. There's a five-week course a lot of material it's a it's a course you have to bring your a game you have to take notes you have to do homework it will change your life but it's work <laughs> when will it start Rocco? probably around mid jan and it's, it's, will it also be on a Sunday, same time or a different time? Yeah. It will probably be Tuesday night. Or t for you, I don't know. I need to it's your it night. What time? Yeah, I'm yeah, Wednesday, my morning. So I don't know. It'll be late for you on Tuesday night. Yeah, six hours I haven't finalized that yet, but you know what I normally do, Romy? I, dip, I see what the majority of people are, and I work it out based on where they are. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. And how much would it cost? I need to work that out. Um, it's about, it's in the region of like, I'm trying to remember now. So far, of course, I think. About $400. About $400. But mm. I'll give you guys, I'll, I'll work something out. What did you say? Two, three? No, I can hear. Yeah, about 400. Apple, yeah. yeah, but I'll figure it out. It'll probably be a little bit less than that, depending on how many people I get. But I usually, uh, um, actually, let me do the sums here. I'll tell you exactly how much it will cost. One second. That's Australian dollars. I'm not that, yeah, I'm not that far yet. No, I'm done. Yeah, it's actually about that, but I'll, I'll work something out for you guys. Probably a little bit, a little, little bit less than that. Make it affordable. And also, the other thing is, um, usually what I do is I cap it off at twelve, 
And if anybody has financial hardship, I don't want that to be a reason that you cannot do the course. So I always reserve a, a slot for every single course um, to make sure. And the, the price um, includes paying for one person that can't afford it so that we are all linking arms together and making sure someone can take the course. So what we cover is um, fundamentals. It's very intense. You're going to have to try and, and keep up, ask all your questions. The aim is to digest um, as much of it as you can, but then you've got to go away and do your own homework and then ask me questions. And then um, I'll actually bring up the five-week program. Well, it's not five it's weeks. like a course they gave in college, like in colleges, a type of course. Yeah, it's, 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 it's quite full on, actually. Um, let me open this. Uh, let me share, share my screen. You see that? Yeah. Yep. So just the fundamentals. So you see there's fundamentals and then there's part one, part two, part three, part four. So squeezing this in so each session each each session will probably be about um a minimum an hour and a half minimum but sometimes oh, yeah. these these things take two 90 minute sessions to get through one one part this is full on this is just the fundamentals Core concepts, actualization, many selves, features and bugs, and things, concepts that we borrow from a myth and philosophy. This is just one concept. This will take us about 20 minutes to discuss. And then the first week is fundamentals. Then we did then the, the, the first part that we discover after the foundation is laid is consent, self-permission, playfulness, actualization. Second one is golden questions, which are the silver questions and some golden questions, self-awareness, motivational triad, the many selves, consciousness in the body. Some of the work we've been doing here, but much deeper is discernment, subjectivity and objectivity, consciousness and trauma, the adult, the child and the animal. And then in the final session, what we do is we bring all of this together and we figure out specifically masculine and feminine wounds and masculine and feminine roles in programming. The difference between quests and tides, this is archetypally. And we figure out how to um, achieve flow. And then we wrap this all up in a daily practice. And the purpose of this is to achieve or to start on a journey of stable mutual actualization psychological self-repair mm. mm. but there is a youtube video you and louise and so another person has on youtube that's accepting your nature right i watched about 30 minutes of it yeah i won't put all of them up because i'm literally doing a train the trainer for those two people that's uh, uh nick and maria yeah oh it was but, nick yeah yeah it was just kind of like, oh, so that's you training other people to do it? Yes. So that's not the course? Oh. No. Okay. Oh. That's a train the trainer. That's cool. Because once you've done this, you can literally run similar classes and courses yourself. Mm, but wow. the point is, if you're going to sit and steer other souls, you really need to know what you're doing. Really, really need to know what you're doing. So. Anyway. That's that. Yeah. I'll keep putting out advertising. And like I did for this facing discomfort, I'll make little videos, make it clear for everybody what's going on, how it's going to work, what the prices is, what the dates will be. I'll figure that all out. I need to take a break over December and work that all out. But Take a break and work it all out or take a break? Maybe take a break, Rocco? Yeah, break. I've got to take a break. Oh, I'm so close to finishing my book. I've got to finish writing that. I've got to do this train the trainer course. I've got to wrap you guys up next week. Um, yeah, shit's going wild. I sometimes bite off a little bit too much, I think. Mm -hmm. No one else well, is head. coming, right? 
Who knows it's coming? <laughs> okay, I've got to go to bed early this week. It's yeah. um right. 20 past 11. Um, it's been great. Oh, Thanks, guys. Thank I'll you. edit this at some Thank point you. and put the video up. Um, the, the, the notes will come out sometime Monday, Tuesday, <laughs> when I get some time. But remember, you actually all have your exercise. You don't need any emails. The email really should come from you to me, which is to tell me. And if you don't want to tell me, fine, that's your business. But the exercise is you tell me one area of growth, one area that is holding you back in your life. That you're going to face. And how that might look. All right. <laughs> Louise, do you want to stay on the line? Take care.